able to, to scan it? Is there a link? We do also yes. have it on the wiki page. So if you go to um, icewiki.info, I-C-E-W-I-K-I.info, and go to the Friday sessions, um, there's a flipping the classroom portion. It's in like a table. Um, it has the resources. I also have a URL. I can grab it real quick. Flip 
And it's not just a one year time frame, it is only one class that's being represented or one prep of one class. Um, but it's two year time frame for the traditional model and then a two year time frame for the flipped model. The next one are the classes that I teach. Um, our classes are tracked in the foreign language department. Um, and we have what we call the college prep or the regular track, which is all of the students or the majority of the students that have accommodations, um, special needs, uh, and your middle level students. The students that are interested in the AP track or moving at an honors type pace are in a different track. So this is just illustrating in the green the classes that were flipped, the regular classes or the college prep classes, um, and the numbers over the percentages of A's, B's, and C's versus the A's, B's, and C's for the other classes, the non-flipped classes. As you can see, there are still D's, but they're significantly less, and there are still F's. So flipping is not the magic be-all, end-all to solve all of your problems. You're still going to have issues with students, but there are 10% more A's than there are in the traditional class and this was over last year. This is one of my videos. So I teach math. Um, I did start flipping my geometry concepts class, which is a lower level class at my school, and I just started the second semester. So this is one of my videos from it that's on YouTube. And we'll talk more about how we host our videos and set it up in just a second. We just wanted to make sure everyone has the same background information. talk about areas of trapezoids. So if you look at this picture right here, you don't have to write this down. I'm just going to kind of talk about it. You'll see we have a triangle here, a triangle here, and then we have this rectangle or square, it depends on what's going on there, in the middle. So you can expect to remember the formula for a triangle, half times base times height. And then you should remember for the rectangle, base times height, right? So it looks like, and I like to use this formula, and this you can highlight or box or circle or do whatever you need to do. That's the formula I like to use. So half times base, except we got a couple of bases going on here, times height. And what I want you to do right now is I want you to write a one in right here. This should be B sub one, that's how we say it. So B sub 1 means the first base, which is going to be this length right here. And B sub 2 means this base right here. And guys, it's the whole base. The entire thing. Don't say, oh, well, there's, there's a perpendicular sign. I, I think I stopped there. No, it's the whole base. And then when you're doing height, make sure you... So it's just a little blurb of my video. As you can see, the personality of the teacher still comes out. You're still guiding your students with, write this down. They still have a note sheet. Um, so the format of the instruction hasn't changed a whole heck of a lot, but as Allison said, the location has changed. So there are plenty of benefits for using these videos. Um, not only can the student learn on their own time, so when it's best for them, when they're in the right space and in the right location, um, they can do it at their own pace, so they're free to pause it, rewatch it, rewind, and go back. Um, so that all has benefits in itself, but it's extremely awesome for review. So I have a lot of students that will go back and rewatch a video um, before a quiz or a test. Um, some days, if it's a really challenging topic, I'll, I'll encourage them to watch it again just to reinforce any um, topics, and then. It's amazing when kids are absent because they can still get the instruction that they would have missed otherwise. Um, and you can treat that however you want. I require my students, if they're absent, they still have to watch the videos that were assigned that day so they come, when they come back they have all of their notes done. I only do that to help them. If I didn't require it, they probably wouldn't do it. Um, but it works for me or any student who's gone for an extended period of time for whatever that reason. Um, they can essentially keep up with the class or be in a better space than they would if you were in a traditional model. Just to piggyback off of that, this was one of the things that most helped my students that had IEPs in which it was uh, stated as an accommodation that students should have teacher-led notes. All of my notes are not only available in print form for the students, but they're also available in audio form. 
for students that have processing difficulties or some of my ELL students that were taking a foreign language class. They were able to read the text and hear my voice. They were able to pause the video, um, just as Allison was saying, or stop the video. For students that weren't able to write as fast as I was able to say things, they'd be able to pause the video or stop it. More important than that, you're not just te teaching the students the content, you're teaching them how to take notes, how to process the information, how to be an active language learner or an active mathematics learner, in their case, with the information. Oh, this is um, my traditional geometry concepts uh, homework guide. I go by day and tell them the assignments, and they get this at the beginning of the chapter. So this is what I used to give out as my homework guide before flip. And then this is not a geometry one, but this is an algebra two trig one, and this is what we give out now. And I know it's a little tiny and you can't really see it there, but what it has is the days and the sections like it normally does, but then there's a column that says in-class practice, so this is what they're doing in class. And then the homework actually says like chapter eight, day two video, or watch chapter eight, day five video and do your take home quiz. And then over here you'll see all the QR codes to the videos. We try to give them as many ways to get to the video as possible. So this is one of our ways right here. Um, one of the benefits, I think, to flipping, and it's the one thing that, for me, it's amazing, and it's the reason I do flip, I get way more one-on-one -on -one time with every single student. So I would say, on average, I probably connect with every student in class two to three times every day. And we have 45 minute class periods, yeah. so they're, they're relatively short. Yeah, the, um, the only drawback to that is there are some students, and all of you have had them, that try to hide and silently fail. So there is some uncomfortableness in that. Those students get a little worked up sometimes because you're always there and you're always trying to help them and trying to move them along. Um, so that's the only thing that's been a little, a little jarring sometimes, but in the end it's better that I'm able to connect with them more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they can get immediate feedback um, from me. The classroom environment definitely shifts. If you walk by my classroom, it's not quiet. It may sound like it's a little chaotic, but it's not. I have them working in groups, and they're all working together, and I'm walking around. Um, the personal connection, especially now that I'm doing it my lower level geometry class, I love it. Like Those students, I feel like, need that reward so much, and I love that I'm able to actually connect with them now. Um, and like I said, they can't hide in class. So you'll have a couple of students that don't like it so much, but in the end, by the end of the year, I've always found that it's so much more helpful to be able to connect with them. Mary has told me that she's exhausted at the end of a class, and I don't dispute that fact, but I feel that it's more relaxing for me in my Spanish classroom. I'm able to move from group to group or student to student, and I'm not looking at my watch thinking, oh gosh, we gotta get through these notes. You gotta start writing faster, kid. Um, we're, we're able to, as she stated, work with students one-on-one -on -one and help them catch up if they've been absent. Work with them if we know that they have a learning disability or their particular uh, learning strategy is different than maybe they're used to, uh, the way that they're used to learning. Um, we're also able to, and this is really the most important point, differentiate in class, which is something that was really challenging in the past when you were lecturing for 45 minutes or for 30 minutes and then saying, okay, now go do these problems, this workbook page, read this article in Spanish, watch this whatever, and come to class answering these, you know, having these questions answered. Um, so this is one of the big questions that we get, so if, especially from parents. If you're not teaching in class, what are you doing in class? What, you're just kind of hanging out? Um, for me, I started flipping three years ago when I was teaching a sophomore level honors class because I realized I'm spending all this time going over grammar, but my kids aren't actually practicing it. I never could hear them speak Spanish, and I thought, this is ridiculous, so I'm going to try this. Um, this particular strategy was introduced to us at a department meeting, or at a, rather at a school uh, meeting with the principal. And the only thing that I did was I Googled John Berkman, Aaron Sams, and that's how I started to find some information. So once the students watch the video outside of class, then they can come to class and apply it. Um, if you're a science teacher, they can have activities or, or labs, they could have peer discussions. Um, like, as I said, there could be a lot of differentiation. I could have students working on one particular concept or one particular uh, set of problems and then another group of students working on another set. In my class specifically, um, do we have any Spanish teachers in here? Yeah, Spanish. 
So Sarah to Star is a challenging concept for kids. So maybe I have them, which are the two verbs in Spanish that mean uh, to be. So maybe I have my students do the video at home, we go over the conjugations, we go over the rules for Sarah and Star, and then we come to class, or they come to class, and we do something particular in class to go over Sarah and Star. The textbook that I use goes over Sarah and Star specifically with house vocabulary. So the kids come to class, we go over the notes just very quickly, maybe I have an in-class quiz or an in-class note check very quickly, then we start applying it. I show pictures of houses and I ask them questions in the target language. Well, what is the sofa made of? What color is it? Where is the sofa located? And those are the different uses of the two verbs in Spanish that mean to be. There's more application for the students and more time for me to answer specific questions that the students have because they can definitely point to the part in their notes where they say, I don't get it. It's no longer a blanket, I don't get it. Now it's, I don't get this particular part or this example isn't making sense to me. So you're making them owners of their own knowledge. Other ways that it's used, um, I know one thing in my class when they come in, so I'll have a warm up of some sort, and they've watched the video, and now they're doing the warm up, and it, I then can tell like, did they even get what I was doing in the video, or maybe they do get it and they're just ready to move on. So I'm able to differentiate like what I'm going to do the rest of the period going off of that. So if they didn't understand something in the video, I know now. Okay, good. I'm going to focus on this in class. Another way, um, another thing that I like is when I have them working in groups on their in-class practice, I'm actually walking around and talking to them and watching them and seeing their work, I can say, hold on, like we all need to stop as a class because this one thing eight of you have asked me. So then I actually have time to be, go over it and say, okay, this is how you do it. Whereas before I was teaching Bell to Bell, we maybe had five minutes to go over homework questions and then that was it. So that's one thing I really like about having that extra time in class. Yeah, so what I, I've been flipping for two years now, and I'm a relatively new teacher. I'm in my second year of teaching. So something that I have, <laughs> I don't flip all my classes, but some of them. And what I've been trying to do, and I've been trying to get better at this, is how I'm asking questions while my students are working in their groups. So instead of being like, um, did you get the answer? I'd be like, yeah, it's five. Um, I say, hey, will you actually explain how you got this answer? Because if they're working in groups, um, especially in math or maybe something like science that they're, they're doing a procedure and sometimes you can easily be like, oh, they did, they added five to both sides. Yeah, I can do that too. Um, to really make sure each individual student is working, I, I like to check in with them and say, hey, actually, how did you get that? Or if they tell me, I don't get this, I'll be like, well, what is it that you don't get? And they're saying, everything, I don't understand it at all. I make them break it down and walk me through the problem because I have time to do that and really make sure that they're getting that understanding that we all hope for. One of the best ways that I could just simply answer this question, how is class time used, is another speaker had said, think of the thing you've always wanted to do in your class. Now you can do it. You have the time. No, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Yeah. You know, I piggyback one thing <laughs> onto that. Sorry. Um, the one thing I always wanted to do is teach them how to study for a math test which none of them know how to do. So I actually got to do that this year and teach them how to study. Like you have to actually do more problems and check them. So that's one thing I always wanted to do and I finally got to do that with Cliff and it's awesome. And, um, one of the things I was nervous about um, when I was swimming, I was like, well now everybody's saying I have all this class time, I need to have all these activities and fun things to do and all these engaging things for my students. And I personally wasn't ready for that every single day nor do I really think they'll be there every single day. It's just, essentially last year we just took the book problems and brought them into class, and that's how we started. And as you continue, you can add and modify and think about, oh, maybe this activity would be a good replacement for those 20 problems that they do. Um, but checking for understanding, that's a huge thing. Uh, we mentioned earlier that you get to check in one-on-one -on -one and they get immediate feedback. So. With all the things that you do, it's easier to say, I know Susie doesn't understand how to do X, Y, Z, and you can help them move through that. Um, but not necessarily everything needs to be in your video. You know, you only have, on YouTube, you only have 15 minutes. I think as you upload more, you get a little bit more time, but in terms of attention span, um, they say like seven to 12 or so minutes is your target. Ours are normally 15. Um, we try to get them shorter, but geometry concepts are 10 or less. 
So you, you know, you'll do whatever works for you, but you're not necessarily going to get everything in, and that's okay. When you get there, I always have a warm up for them to do to even just apply some of the knowledge that they were supposed to learn, because um, they're not required to remember it overnight, not just long enough for them to do their homework right after school. So I do that sometimes exit slips or pop quizzes. I can do them in class on paper, or sometimes I use a Google form. So after they take um, notes, I tell them to go take the quiz just so I can see what it is that I need to focus on in class. So. One of the uh, individuals that's been flipping for a long time, Crystal Kirch, is a math teacher, I think, in Texas. And she uses a strategy called WSQ. There's an example of some WSQ information in the folder of what it is and how it works, so if you're interested in that WSQ. So I know that I use very specific guided notes based on the content that I'm teaching and then the level of student that I'm teaching. Um, so it's very specific guided. Exactly what the students see on the screen is, is the same thing that they have in their packet or the note sheet. But for Crystal Kirch, what she does is watch, summarize, question. So the first thing the student has to do is they have to watch the video. Then there's a space where the expectation that the student summarizes the video in some way. And then the third element of WSQ is that the student has to create a question about the video, about the content, about the information, or the student has to come to class with a specific question that he or she has about the content. So it's making the student a little bit more active for the material outside of class. All right, student accountability. I'm all about routine, and you really should have a routine and stick with it. That is what I recommend. I know that um, when I've talked to teachers in the past that do flipping, and I'm not saying this is wrong because everybody's going to do their own thing with flip, when you do it like here and there and every once in a while, I think students don't get in a routine, and you might not get the results that you want. So I say pick a routine if it's once a week, once a week. If it's once a month, once a month. If it's every day, it's every day. And try to stick to that so then they get used to that in the class. Um, I always assign the videos with more than a day's notice. Um, and I try not checking their notes. And that went really poorly for me. So once I start checking their notes again, more of them did the video. So that's just my experience. I always check their notes. Um, and actually, they're in class practice. If they don't finish it there, they take it home and finish it, the last couple of problems. I actually check that on completion the next day, and then they get an answer key and I collect it too. So I actually grade a lot. You don't have to do that. That's just what I do. But especially with the notes, I find checking the notes keeps them a lot more accountable. Um, I love Remind 101. Uh, it's free, you can sign up for it. It's a fake little phone number of some sort. They sign up through that phone number, and then I type in little texts to send them, and it gets blasted out to all their phones. But it's not from my phone number. So I love Remind 101. I use it every day. I text them every day. I tell the parents about it, and some of the parents forward the text to their students at night, <laughs> even though they're signed up too. But um, Rewind 101 works great for me. We also have a feature in PowerSchool called Email Blast. I can send all the parents and all the students an email all at once. So I try to utilize that too. And then there's also Schoology, Edmodo, Moodle. I haven't had time to delve into those yet because I'm too busy flipping and getting used to the basics of it. So I haven't actually used those very much yet. So here's a big question that everybody's always wondering. What do you do if they don't watch? Well, I would, anybody who asks me that, I say, well, what do you do when your student doesn't do their homework? There's going to be that kid in every single class, every single year, there are kids who just won't do their homework. And it is what it is. You can do your best to help them through it. So what I like about um, Flipped is I have time to check in with each kid. Anytime I have a student that doesn't do their notes, I ask them why, and I make them tell me. Instead of being like, I don't know, like, no, but really, why didn't you do it? And it makes them own the fact that they chose not to do their homework. And, you know, things come up. I, I do check notes every day, but in terms of points, if they miss it once or twice, it doesn't really affect their grade. Um, but they think it does, so they, they usually do it. But I always conference with the student about it. And you never know, sometimes other things come up. I was working till 1030. My internet didn't work. So it's always good to have that conversation. Um, Especially when you're starting, if any student is new to the routine, emailing parents is always helpful. Um, just shoot an email, hey, 
your student didn't watch the video, to be successful it's really important that they do it. The video can be found here. I use a website, so I always send the link. Um, that's one way to do it. I usually let my students, if they have a phone, most of them have a way to watch it. They'll watch it in class right there. I don't give them points either way, but they'll watch it before they start the practice. Sometimes the student will still be able to do the assignment, and I let them do that too. You can work with your school library, send your kid to the library to watch it. Um, it's really up to you, but I have my kids work in groups, and so do most people who flip their classroom. And if they don't watch the video, their group members then have to kind of hold their hands and walk them through it and explain everything. And they get really annoyed, and they tell the kid, you need to watch your video because I don't want to do this anymore. They don't want to be responsible for anybody else. So I found in my experience in the two years that just the nature of the class, the students don't want to not watch the video because it's more frustrating for them. And I never go through my notes again. Sometimes I'll do an extra problem, maybe one I didn't get through or one that I know that they're going to struggle with, but the basics of the lesson, I won't teach them again to the kids who didn't watch the video. I tell them, you know what, I'm not gonna help you until you do your part, and then I'll do mine, and it works for me, but you'll just have to figure out what works for you. There's no like magic thing that's gonna get everybody to do their homework, and somehow you're gonna inspire them to change, but <laughs> maybe let me know if it works for you. <laughs> um, but that's what I do. Um, I think one of the benefits of the flipped classroom is now you, because you've developed a personal relationship with the student, because you can say, hey Mary, you had, a, you had track practice or you had a big meet, how did that go? You have time to have that quick two minute conversation that really means something to your student. You now have that relationship where you can ask them, what's going on? You haven't done the video at all this week, what, what's going on? And the students really appreciate that and they've been opening up to us. This is another large question that we get. What if my school has no technology? So on the first day of classes, I ask my students this. Who has a Facebook account? And inevitably, every single hand goes up. And Facebook's kind of on the outs with some of our kids. So who does Tumblr? Who's on Instagram? Who's on Snapchat? If they have access to these apps, they have access to the internet. They can get it. And that's really what I'm asking. Like, can you get access? Other things is that, or other ideas, access while at school. We're very blessed in that we have many computer labs, um, and so I can send the students to a computer lab during the period opposite their lunch. They have a 25 minute lunch, 25 minute uh, computer lab or study hall time. We also have a library where we can send them during class, and some students just need that quiet time in the library, and then they're, they're fine, they come back. Jump drives. My students that have the test read accommodation, I use the Camtasia software to create their test read because we don't have Spanish speaking or bilingual uh, special ed aids. So I have to create the whole test, screencast the whole test, um, state the directions the way that the students need them stated one, two, three times, and then I provide them with a jump drive so they can take it in the testing facility. Also, as Mary stated, providing multiple days to watch the video. On average, in my class, students are watching video two, maybe three times a week. So it's not an every single day sort of thing. So there really shouldn't be any excuses why if I explain that you have a video due on Wednesday and I'm assigning it on the Friday before or the Monday before, there really shouldn't be an excuse as to why you can't get to the library, uh, the computer lab, access to it on your phone, or ask me, hey, I don't have any of those accesses. Could I borrow your computer during your lunch period? Alright, so if you want to start doing this, um, I was blessed that when I first started doing flip um, with Algebra 2 Trig, I had a team of five teachers I worked with. But this year I'm by myself in geometry, so now I know what it's like to try to do it all by yourself. So the first thing I would say is I strongly encourage you to try to work with somebody else if you can. If you can't, I am living proof that you can do it by yourself also. Um, consider one topic or one lesson. I know that I've talked with some teachers at the 9th and 10th grade campus, and they were like, you know what, we're going to do it the last chapter of the school year. So for the last chapter of the school year, we're going to flip and see how it goes, just to kind of test it out. Um, so consider a topic, consider a lesson, design around what you want them to know before class. One thing that you will find is when you're doing your videos, you're really going to figure out pretty quickly, like, what do they need to know? What can you just cover in class when they come back? Because 15 minutes, I'm a math teacher. That's not a lot of time for me to talk. Like, I'm used to talking for like a half hour at a time in the 11th and 12th grade campus. Um, 
So five to 15 minutes geometry concepts. I do the bare bones basics, and then I have a couple of problems in the video I give them, and I say do these before class, they'll bring it in, I'll go over those couple of problems. So then they see it in the video, and then they kind of see a couple of problems when they come to class, and then we can get started on everything. Um, focus on what they do after they watch, what is happening in the classroom. So my routine, and, and everybody's is different, especially according to subject, um, we do the warm up, I check everything, I finish up the notes, I say, hey, are we good, you know, any questions, I kind of look at the warm up, and then they get to their groups and they just start practicing, practicing, practicing what they watched the night before and what we just did at the beginning of class. Um, and remember, it's not really about the video, it's about you finally getting to work with these students one-on-one, -on -one. you finally getting to know when they leave your classroom and the bell rings, you know what they know and what they don't know. And I did not know that before, teaching the whole period, I really didn't. I did when they took the test and the quiz and then that was about it. So that's, that was my big focus. Um, John Bergman made a comment one time that you have to ask yourself, the video is not always going to be perfect, and you have to ask yourself, do you want the video done perfectly, or do you want it done by Tuesday? And so in all of our videos, there are, are errors sometimes. Not necessarily errors with content, but you stumble on a word, or you're screencasting in, the, um, in your classroom and then the bell rings, or someone gets called down to detention. It, it doesn't matter, that's okay. Those things still happen in the classroom. The video doesn't have to be perfect. It has to concisely express the information that you want the students to be able to practice. And I've made a mistake in I've video before at all. Algebra two trick kids, which is like, a lot of students watched it and then they're like, there was a mistake. But that's okay, you go over it and then you can always redo it for the next year. I wasn't about to like take it down or try to upload it before everybody was watching it. Um, and that happens. You can always make your videos better as you year to year. And Allison and Mary are part of a team of five or six? Five. Five and teachers. And then I'm by myself. Yeah. Can you talk about the five teachers and with the students' reactions? Uh, if you, we'll get to that. In okay. Time. Yeah. <laughs> so this is an example of one of Mary's. Um, That's remember the geometry one I showed you. It just said day two, eight four. Here are the problems. So by the way, this helps me too, especially with flipping. I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we doing in class today? Because it's new for me too, right? And I don't flip all my classes. So I have some classes that are traditional and some that are flipped. Again, it shows the in-class practice. This is what we're doing in class, and you'll notice there's a lot of worksheets with my lower level. And then here are all the videos. I don't QR code my videos yet, geometry concepts, because I'm day to day. So when I give them this at the beginning of the chapter, they're not all done. So. You don't have to QR code, you don't have to have every single video in the entire chapter done ahead of time. Instead, I made worksheets for the, this class here, and I put my QR code on the worksheet, and I have learned something this year that I'm going to do an Algebra 2 trick next year. I also write what my YouTube channel name is on the side, because they will find ways of saying, QR code didn't work, couldn't do it. So I'll be like, oh, well, here's the channel, here you go. Yes? Do you use JR? I use screencast the mat. We're going to talk about that too. And then she uses Camtasia. All right. Speaking of, how do you make your video? Um, I use Screencast-O-Matic. It is free. It, it can be either run from the web application. You can download it on your computer. Um, but it, the one that you watched earlier, that was using Screencast-O-Matic. And we upload them to YouTube. But there's plenty of video software, Camtasia. I know Dominique uses that. Um, I can't afford it, so I use Screencast. Um, but you can use, there's so many different things. There's iPad specific ones, um, and they all pretty much work fine. But you don't necessarily have to use your own video either. Um, if you want to supplement a lesson, you might find one online for you. Um, on YouTube, there's plenty. Uh, Khan Academy, TED, um, those are just different ways you can do it. I, I will say that your videos are better. What you make for your student is better because it's exactly how you want to present it. You never know, sometimes they solve something a little bit differently or the wording maybe isn't what you're going to say in class and you want to keep it as consistent as possible. And in my team, we've got five different teachers. So every five videos, they hear me only every five videos and they're like, Oh, will you just make the video? I'm like, well, she said it the same way I would have, uh, but sometimes they miss you and they like hearing you. The so nice thing is, though, we have 4,000 kids in our school, so at least they know five teachers now. So <laughs> teachers. Um, 
And then, so this is a picture actually of some of the science teachers at our building. They use Camtasia. This is like a laptop on a chair, on a desk table with a webcam. There's the webcam. It's like putting together what they had, you know, not a fancy webcam, not a fancy laptop. Um, and they actually video themselves. They, they have like a PowerPoint that they're running through and there's three of them in their video, sometimes two, but then they, they kind of play the one's reading it, one's the curious student. They were on CBS a couple weeks ago, CBS Evening News. So that's what they do. We don't put our faces in our video because um, we have to write and it's kind of, you use whatever you need to, but um, how do they access it? We have ours on YouTube, which is great because it's pretty much available anytime, anywhere. YouTube is rarely down for any reason, so it's pretty reliable. Uh, we use QR codes. I put a link on my website. Sometimes I email. I just make sure they have every way to get there as possible, so there's no excuses. And then you can use a note sheet, like our guided notes that you saw, or you could just write it. Um, you could use, like, if you have a Microsoft computer, you could use OneNote. Um, or journal, or even in Microsoft Word if you have a tablet. It really depends on your computer and what your situation is, but there's plenty of ways to make it happen. Oh, technology. Okay, right, so I use Screencast-O-Matic. It's free, it works for me. I love the laptop that our school has. It has like, it's old. And it has like the old pen that only works with that laptop, so it's not like the iPad with your finger and all that. Anyway, so for me, screencasting that it works, and I can give you my YouTube links and whatnot. Um, I know Don uses Camtasia. Um, there's a little bit higher of a learning curve with Camtasia, but I was uh, lucky enough to go to the FlipCon in Chicago, and they gave all the attendees a free software key. Um, I would say it's, it's well worth the $300 price tag. So if you can get, it's, I think it's a little bit cheaper if you buy it in bulk or your school buys it in bulk. Um, if you can do that, it's well worth it. There's a lot of support. They have reps that are here. They're awesome. Go ahead. Yeah, there's, they're selling it for 100 bucks. Oh, oh today. that's nice. 100 bucks nice. if you go to the booth today. <laughs> it's well worth it. Um, and I use that specifically with my students that have accommodations that need to have the audio component of my assessments. Um, with the spoken direction portion of my um, assessments. Um, I had used Jing to answer that question in the past, but they eliminated the free version of Jing, um, so that's why I moved away from that and I moved to Screencast-O-Matic. Our school really does love free. Free. Mm -hmm. It's super easy to use, but whatever you use. Um, um, for YouTube, you do need to teach them how to use it. You think that they can go to a video and watch it, but don't assume that. And I have 11th to 12th graders. So for YouTube, the first day of school, I use that time and I show a video and say, here's how you take notes. Here's where it's at. I'm going to play it during class. It's going to be super awkward because it's me talking, but I'm not actually talking or watching a video. And I teach them how to get to it, take notes on the video, and do that. I really, really encourage you to demo it. Don't assume that they know how to do anything ahead of time. And also, don't label your videos. You'll notice that my homework guide said chapter eight, day five, or whatnot. We used to put those in the video. Then my curriculum changed, and now I gotta redo the video, and it was a perfectly good video to begin with. So I, I strongly suggest don't put any chapter numbers in there. You can do that in the title and then change that title on YouTube later. But don't actually videotape the name, the chapter number or the day number. Keep it, you know, just keep it vague, like us. Yeah solving equations, right? then you're probably going to teach it, but it might move and you don't want to have to read you everything if you don't have to. And you can organize it any way you want. I use Weebly. Like I said, you can use Schoology, you can use Edmodo, you can use Moodle, whatever works for you. And then the QR codes, you can just generate those online. I use, I think it's QR code generator and super easy. Um, Mary and Allison were talking about that other teachers in your department are of uh, particular help to you or good resources. Here are other resources, your technology department. Make sure that you get them on board because if you have a technology integration specialist and you can ask them, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, they're going to be all over it. They're going to love that you want to use these different apps and all of these different things. Um, FlippedLearning.org is a website. It's uh, John Bergman and Aaron Sam's website, and they have tons of resources. They have research on flipping. Um, they have different groups that you can join, forums, to get support for your content area or the age of the student that you're teaching. Um, in Schoology, there's a flipped community. I think there's one in Edmodo as well. So you just get links sent to your phone if you join the Schoology community. Twitter. 
Um, there are, for my content area, there's a foreign language uh, class chat on Thursdays at 7. There's also a flipped class chat. So all you do is log on to your Twitter account and you uh, put in a particular hashtag and you're part of that global conversation. Um, flipping your classroom is the book in green. It's by John Bergman and Aaron Sams. It's a very good uh, resource to start flipping, like what do you do? Um, or the Flipping Book 2.0 by Bretzman, and it has a whole host of different authors explaining how exactly they flipped their elementary school reading curriculum, or their elementary school reading classroom, or their uh, world languages high school classroom, so it's very, very specific. Um, other than that, the internet's your best friend. If you just Google it, you're going to get tons of resources, both positive and negative, for flipping um, your classroom. But these are the resources that we've used to enhance what we do for this strategy. So if you guys have any questions, we are kind of hitting that 130 mark. Um, feel free to email us. We love talking about the Flip Classroom, and sometimes if you just need a little help getting started, we are all available here to help you. Um, and the today's meet, if you guys have been following that, hopefully maybe some of your questions got answered. If not, will that be available for you? Sure. By the way, just to recap who's who, DGO Paris at WTHS.net is the foreign language teacher at the 9th and 10th grade campus, Allison Nardini, 11th and 12th grade, and mathematics, and I'm Mary Storvik, 11th and 12th grade mathematics. So I was just going to move to today's meet to see if we had any questions. <coughs> Because the language is so, 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 so